present to you the technical evangelist for Microsoft Czech Republic, Mr. Stepan Behinsky. Please give him a warm welcome. So hello, uh, my name is Stepan, and uh, first time I want to see to show you this picture. Uh, do you know what that? It's a forest fire on, uh, in Montana, U.S. So, do you know what is this? It's Fu Fukushima nuclear power plant. Do you know what that? It's Prague. Four months ago, we were totally flooded in Prague. This one? It's a Shanghai. It's a smoke in Shanghai. So, I think it's quite interesting places, but definitely do you don't want to be there. You don't want to be in the middle of the fire forest. You don't want to be close to Fukushima. You don't want to be close to Prague Flats. But you need information what's happened there. And this is a job for Internet of Things. So now, in my speech, you will see how you can use some kinds of very small computers to monitor your living environment to collect data to know what's happened in places which can be potentially dangerous for the people. So for example this concept has been heavily used during the Fukushima disaster because of radioactivity no one wants to go to that area but if you put their autonomous device which can collect data you are safe and you know what happened in that area. The origins of the term Internet of Things in, are in 1999 used by Kevin Ashton on MIT and he showed some concept in his thesis about connecting or put unique identification to any object so you can track the position of the object and you, you can know what happened with that object. This. Uh, Auto ID used uh, RFID, and it was b it have been heavily used in some stores to really track what you have in the store. Every box in the store had the RFID, so you can track what's happened inside the store. Uh, times are changing, so now Internet of Things is about autonomous devices which are connected to some kind of the network. Those devices are connected to some autonomous sensor networks or to the Internet. So it doesn't mean that Internet of Things is just connect some devices to Internet. It can be so you can connect a lot of devices to some independent network just for your research or for your purposes. So typical usage for autonomous, for some close sensor networks are in the forest maybe you know there are big uh, fire, uh, forest fires in the US it's quite a common situation in the US and the government and firemen are monitoring those big areas creating just sensor network for a big forest and those networks are typically not connected to internet because they don't need it they just need to know what happens in their forest The typical thing you are doing with Internet of Things is the monitoring environment. So you can monitor the weather condition, the water quality, how you monitor water quality. The easiest way how to monitor water quality. It's using the light sensor. So you know how dark the water is. So this is the easiest way how you can monitor the water quality. You can monitor the air quality. We have a very nice project in Czech Republic named Kanarci. Kanar, it's a canary bird. Those birds were used in the mines detecting the poison gases. So we have very nice projects that you can build your own device monitoring the quality of the air. And then you can decide if you go with kids outside or not. It's, it's used in the north part of the Czech Republic. The area named is Ostrava, it's close to Polish border, and this area is 
they have big, big problems with the dust particles in the air. So they are, the mothers with the small kids are using these small devices to measure if they will go outside with kids or if they will play inside. You can measure radioactivity, the Fukushima. The Fukushima is perfect example for Internet of Things. You will see how to measure noise. I have a small demo here about. You can measure soil quality, forest fire, and you can measure almost everything. So, the typical users, of course, the strange geeks like we. Uh, it's very popular uh, for data journalists. I don't know if you know the term data journalism. It's, uh, you know, journalists. So it's a special kind of journalists that are taking, da digging data from different sources and put it together to make some story. So you will see one device I developed for one Czech data journalist to measure quality of highways in the Czech Republic. Of course, activists. We have a lot of activists in Czech Republic which want to, which pressures to public sector, pressures to government to make a living environment better. So, for example, reduce the speed in the city, on the, in the center of the cities, because if you reduce speed, you reduce the noise in the city. Of course, public sector and, of course, the student uh, projects. You will see very simple example for the student projects here too. The biggest part of my speech will be about hardware. So you will see a lot of hardware. Of course, you will see how to program it. But now let's speak about the hardware. First, what you need to measure something, you need some sensors. It just depends how many money do you have because you can monitor almost everything. It's a just question of money. Of course, if you want to monitor just the temperature, the price of the temperature sensor is, okay, three Czech crowns. It's 0 0.01 of pound. It costs nothing. But if you want to measure, let's say, radioactivity, you will pay for the sensor around 100 uh, US dollars. So it's, let's say, 80 pounds. So it really depends which kind of the sensor do you need and how many money you want to spend. Uh, sometimes you don't, because, of course, if you want to measure something and you want to use this in some discussion, for example, with the government, they told you, OK, but those sensors are, they doesn't have any certification. So we, won't, we don't want to speak with you. But sometimes you need to measure just the change. You are looking for the change. You have some situation. Someone tells you, OK, we will do this. It will help to solve your problems. They do it. And you measure the, the reality after the change. So for example, this we are using for measuring the quality of the uh, Highway D1, because we, made, we did some measurements before reconstruction, and we plan to do some measurements of the quality of the highway after the reconstruction. And you will see, we expect to see some change. So here you can see a couple of sensors. Maybe here is some clicker with the laser. No. Okay, laser. Okay. Can you see? Ah, can you see laser? So, do you know what's this? It's a GPS. It's an antenna, typical uh, GPS antenna. Uh, this one, the motion sensor. It's microphone, so something with sound. It's a noise sensor. My favorite one is. This one, it measures dust particles. This stuff you can find in air condition. Uh, it used very strange units because this one is designed for the US market. And you know, some countries doesn't use the common units. 
like here, for example. So it measures the unit of this is number of dust particles in the square feet. But it works. This one, it's for soil. How many water is on the soil? How wet is the soil? You will see some sensors in a couple of minutes. So if you have sensors, you need to dig the data from the sensors. It's really not a good idea to use some standard computer to do it because it consumes a lot of energy and everything. So if you are working with the sensor and you want to process data from the sensors, you will probably use some microcontroller. The microcontroller or one chip computer is very tiny computer with inputs and outputs. Typically it's an 8-bit computer. It's very cheap. It's very small and it consumes a very few power. This one is very important because imagine the big forest and you need to have a lot of sensor on the big, very big area. You cannot change battery every day. So you need this independent device work for works work on battery for a month or for a years. So you need to use some different kind of computer. Try this one, work on battery. Five hours, six hours, and you are done. Of course, there are a lot of disadvantages. You need to have a quite good developers because those developers must know how to work with this microcontroller to save memory, to save power, to save everything because it's too small and you, in a couple of minutes you will see a very small computer which can hold just a couple of bytes or, or, or which has a couple of bytes, not kilobytes, just a couple of bytes of the memory and you must deal with that. And the very big problem is that those small computers doesn't have the real-time clock because they doesn't have a backup battery to run some real-time clock uh, device on it. So, I start with a very interesting device named Pizzaxe. It's produced here in the UK. It's very simple. I think it's quite powerful, especially for uh, student projects, because it costs almost nothing. So imagine computer for a one and a half pound with a couple of inputs and a couple of outputs. So let's switch to my special device. And this is computer. It can be much more smaller. It's so big because of the big pins on it. But this is a real computer with the memory, with input, with outputs. This one can be connected to mobile phone, for example, using the Bluetooth module because it, has, uh, it can communicate using the serial port. It's quite funny device. So I show you a little bigger brother of this computer. So, okay. So the computer is this uh, stuff on the left side. It's a bigger brother of the previous one. And this is very simple application you can use, for example, to measuring the quality of the water. So how much water is dark? Because here we have the photo sensor. And if it's dark, the numbers are changing. So I can measure very easy the amount of the light. And it can be useful to measure, for example, the quality of the water. The easiest way how to measure quality of the water. So just put this to some waterproof jacket. Dive it to water. Add some memory to save data and it will work as a very simple student project. And again, you can everything publish to internet and so on. Uh, if you want to do something bigger, 
you probably know the Arduino. The Arduino is probably the most popular small computer for hobbyists. The Arduino has very big community. The pr Arduino is produced in uh, originally produced in uh, Italy. It's quite cheap. And if you want to write some program for it, you need to know the C language. I think the biggest advantage of the Arduino are shields. It's a system how to connect different devices, sensors or relays or whatever display to this computer. You will see it, uh, you will see it in a couple of minutes. If you need a uh, higher performance, you can use .NET Micro Framework. .NET Micro Framework is produced by Microsoft. It's open source software and open hardware platform for small computers. You can imagine that .NET Micro Framework is some kind of operating system. If you want to compare it to Arduino, it has much higher performance, much more memory, so you can do much more things on it because it's much more powerful, but it's more expensive and because of it's more expensive, the community around .NET Micro Framework is not so big as around the uh, Arduino. Raspberry Pi, very famous device now. It's very, very bad idea to use it for direct collecting data from the sensors. Because the Raspberry Pi, it's a computer, so it consumes a lot of memo a lot of power. Those small computers need tens of milliamperes, but the Raspberry Pi needs hundreds of milliamperes. And it's quite easy to put those compu small computers to sleep to consume less than one milliampere. You cannot do this with Raspberry Pi, so then you need a big battery or you need uh, some power plug. It's quite good idea to use it as some central point if you are collecting data from the lot of sensors. The Raspberry Pi as a central point with a good power plug, with a good internet connectivity. I think it's a good idea to use it. Or you can use standard computer. You will see it in a couple of minutes. So let's have a look to different kind of microcontrollers. I have a lot of them with me. So uh, this is typical Arduino. So this one is the microcontroller and the rest is just some you know peripheries, nothing more. Or it can look like this. It's an Arduino in different shape, but still Arduino. Here I have one uh, very interesting. It's much more complicated, but still Arduino. Here you can see a backup battery for real-time clock. Here you can see slot for SD card. And this is wireless module. I will speak about those modules later. And this one is ready to be powered by solar energy. So this combination can create a very interesting end node for some sensor network because it works on solar energy or battery. You have you have here wireless connectivity and you have you have backup battery for real time clock and if something is broken with the wireless connectivity you can very easily use the SD card but still Arduino if we go to something more powerful it looks like Arduino, it's Netduino so it uh, here is a uh, ARM chip, it's a Cortex 3 or 4, I think. It runs .NET Micro Framework as operating system, but it's compatible with Arduino shields. The shield, 
for example, this one. So you can connect it here. And this is a GP, uh, GPRS module, so for wireless connectivity using uh, GSM network. Here you can see LAN connectivity, again SD card, or this one. Again, wireless connectivity, SD card, Arduino compatible. This one is .NET Gadgeteer compatible. Or another one. This one is quite interesting. Uh, it has quite a lot. It's a one megabyte memory, two megahertz processor. This one has, I think, four megabytes memory and uh, 72 megahertz uh, ARM processor again. Raspberry Pi somewhere. Here we are. Raspberry Pi. Or the addition with more memory in the case. And here you can see if you want to connect some sensor to Raspberry Pi, you use these connectors here. It's a GPIO. So here you can connect, for example, a temperature sensor or whatever. So, as you can see, you have a lot of choices for the hardware. It depends what you need to do and how, again, how many money you want to spend. Internet of Things is something about the network. So, the idea is I have a lot of sensors, I connect it to some network. So I have a lot of information, some big data. I can process it, so I can do something with that. So I can prevent the fire in the forest, for example. So it's uh, not a good idea to connect every single sensor to the internet directly, because it costs a lot of money. Those modules can be quite expensive. This is the, mo the GPRS module. And again, it consumes a lot of energy. So, for example, this GPRS modules needs up to 2 amperes. 2 amperes is a lot of power, comparing to 10 milliamperes, for example. So, what you can do, you can create some central node, and you can create some sensor network, and connect the sensors to the central node, using the wires or wireless. The most common system how to, come on, uh, how to connect wirelessly different sensors to some central node is to use the industry standard ZigBee. ZigBee is an industry standard protocol for wireless networks. It enables to you to create network with the different topology and these wireless networks works like an internet. So for example, if this node died, or this one, almost nothing happened because there is still some road to connect the rest of the sensors. So if you kill this one, it's bad for this part, but the rest is still working. It really works like internet with the routing and everything. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, kinds of uh, those sensors. So the, the cheapest one looks like that. It can communicate theoretically up to 90 meters. But the reality is 20 to 30 meters. But if you use different module with the same shape, of course, for example, with some antenna, it can communicate up to 80 kilometers. Uh, of course, if you communicate to 80 kilometers, you need much more power. This one consumes less than 10, 10 milliamperes. It consumes nothing. So I connect it to my computer, and what is funny, this one works like a wireless serial port. 
So the using this for communication for developers is really easy. So I connect it to my computer. Oh, sorry, sorry. Then I connect this one. So we have 23 degrees of Celsius and the pressure is 1017 1 uh, hectopascals. And if I run my application here, so you can see the same data from here and now I am sending those data to the internet so remember the 23 degrees temperature so if I run my application here you should see I hope 23 degrees come on it should change to 23 Okay, nothing happened, never mind. But it's very easy. I can have more devices like that with different sensors. Ah, sorry, 29. So it works. Okay, it works. So you can have a lot of different end nodes connected to one computer. If I run this device, Again, it would send data to my computer because those two nodes, those two devices, those two sensor, those two wireless uh, modules are configured to communicate with this central node. And I can have a lot of them and I can create really, let's say, complex network. This network is self-healing. Everything is like an internet. So, I kill this one, go back. So, what to do if you want to take data from your sensor network and push it and push those data to the internet? What you can do? You can use a lot of kinds of connectivity. So, you can use LAN. Uh, this is Wi Fi module. Those modules are damn expensive. Or you can use. GPRS standard computer or you can use your mobile phone here we are so so you can use your mobile phone so how to use your mobile phone for the internet of things and why to do that Sometimes you want to create some mobile application, for example, collecting data when you are walking or collecting data from the car or collecting data from some, I don't know, flying objects. Because the mobile phone has data connectivity, mobile phone has GPS, mobile phone has accelerometer and mobile phone has real-time clock. So it's quite interesting device for Internet of Things when you want to create some mobile application. So it means the sensors are moving. So here you can see the results of some uh, project from Czech Republic. So this is the screenshot of application we'll see in a couple of minutes. Uh, this is my car. This is the noise sensor. This is the Bluetooth sensor. This is small computer. It was very funny for my kids to driving this car with these devices. 
and uh, this is the vibrations of the highway. Bad, very, very bad. I know that area. It's terrible to drive there. The vibrations I measured using the accelerometer inside the phone, and here <laughs> is the noise. So here you can see big vibrations, the higher noise. And uh, if you think about that, if you have a really good car, the noise inside is very, very low, and it's absolutely, Im it's almost independent on the quality. Uh, where is the? It's almost independent on the quality of the surface. Just the vibrations are higher. So let's look at it. So first I need to start this device. Uh, this device has been used uh, by me and I did it for one uh, journalist in the Czech Republic. So my device is running now. So uh, this is the noise sensor. It's not a microphone, it's a real noise sensor and the output is in decibels. Uh, this is just some uh, uh, LED just for tests and this one is a Bluetooth module. So using this one I'm sending data to the phone and from the phone to my device. And here I run my application. So if I start it, this, uh, this changed blinking, I'm connected and in a couple of seconds it sends the data. So here you see the data and if I make some noise, the numbers will be higher. See it? It is 2, 3, 4. So it's some kind and here you can see we are in Auto Arena in uh, London. So, of course, the numbers here are just some numbers corresponding to the noise. It's not an absolute noise level because I don't need it. Because I take the same device in two years and I will go the same road. And I will be just looking if the red one will turn to green one because our government promised us we will fix this highway. So, what to tell on the end before the questions? Don't think just about the software. Think about the hardware, because with some hardware, with this cheap and simple hardware, you can do much more thing than with the software only and think how you can help using those stuff to our environment, to people around you. So thank you and if you have any questions, I am ready. Thank you. So some questions? Uh, there's Mike. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Thank you for the interesting presentation. So my question is, uh, the sensor that you are buying, for example, for uh, an, uh, where the radiation is present, perhaps the electronics of that sensor is uh, not sensible to radiation, but uh, the rest of the electronics that support that sensor is perhaps uh, sensible to radiation. So what you what uh, techniques do you are, are you using to protect that uh, the rest of the electronics? Okay, uh, the question is, uh, if you want to measure, for example, radioactivity, how do you protect some parts of your device which is sensitive to radioactivity? Uh, I didn't these uh, measurements myself. Uh, I think the good idea is to ask guys from hackerspace in Tokyo, because they did it. But I think if you put uh, if you put those devices for a uh, ten days or a week 
it will not destroy it. Okay, but uh, that is uh, the same problem w where the water conditions, uh, the, there is a lot of water. Okay, uh, the question is about how to protect those devices against the water. Uh, you can buy, a, uh, there is, a, mm, uh, uh, there is, a, how to say it in English, wait a moment. Norma. Regulations. There are regulations for waterproof of the some uh, cases so it's uh, ip so if you have for example if you have box uh, ip54 with the covering ip54 it means you can put it on the rain and the rain will not go inside so you can buy really waterproof boxes and you can buy waterproof sensors the water totally waterproof box is ip67 and if you buy a waterproof sensor, it will cost 10 times more than non-waterproof. So it exists everything. Just, uh, I don't have the waterproof box here with me, but I, I have one. It has cover, it, is, uh, it has 64. So it means you can put it uh, in uh, uh, for a couple of hours, uh, one meter deep. So it's a it's real regulation. It's international regulation. If you buy, if you go to some hobby shop, you take some box, for example, for you know the electricity for power electro uh, electricity. You will there will be something like IP and some number, and this number tells you how much waterproof is it. The first number is how much waterproof is it, and the second number is about dust particles or maybe it's different but it's uh, there are some regulations around that so it everything it exists it's no problem to to do it and you know it's quite interesting if you want to <laughs> uh, sometimes people are looking for the electric uh, engines which are waterproof and if you take the regular engine and put it in water it will probably survive and it will work not so long but it will work with no problems. Couple of months, days, hours, whatever. Okay. So another question. Yes, thank you. Um, I was uh, wondering if you're using any cloud-based data collection and storage services, and any ones that you have a uh, good, uh, no, um, experience with, uh, like Sively or something. Uh, I have been using the uh, PudgeBee before. The question is about where to put data. If we collect a lot of data, where to put them on the internet? So uh, the very popular project was the PudgeBee. It renamed to Cosmo, Cosm, and now it's uh, Sively. So I have using it before, but now I starting to use the Windows Azure. It's uh, our technology. It's Microsoft technology because I work at Microsoft. And I am using the Windows Azure Data Storage. Windows Azure Data Storage is uh, some kind of non-SQL database. And you, it's ready to store, let's say, tens of billions rows per hour, for example. It's ready for huge data, but it costs some money. So if for the Hobie project, use Xively. It works. For commercial project, I think it's better to use some commercial solution like Windows Azure or uh, Amazon uh, Cloud or uh, App Engine from Google. It really depends on you. It really depends how many data do you have. Okay, if you collect, let's say, million of rows per day, it's nothing. It's not, it's not a big amount of data you can store it almost in any database. If you have a uh, lot of, and you need to work with them real time, you need a really big solution then, definitely. Uh, the question? Hi, um, great session. Um, just wanted to know, um, that so there's many things that you can do with this. Uh, water, um, the radioactivity, and all that kind of stuff. Um, being a wireless, a wireless engineer myself, I wanted to look at the spectrum 
So these devices can actually, they're receiving signals that you can uh, process that signal and, analyze, and yeah. get the spectrum out of them. But um, this is a very intensive uh, calculation, and uh, doing it on uh, doing it on the computer uh, is not going to be very uh, timely. So the best way um, we should uh, be able to do it is on the pe on, on the machine uh, on the device, and then send the spectrum yep. to to the com But um, because this FFT uh, 1020 1, 1024 bit bins is is very uh, complicated. Uh, so, what do you suggest, and um, what is um, the speed that uh, the the sample rate that uh, the the link between the device and the computer uh, can take? Uh, my second question is why you're not taking TI into account. TI's uh, RF uh, twenty five zero zero is one of the most used as well, and. Okay. Um, yeah. So I start with the first question. Yeah. So uh, it really depends on hardware you use. Uh, so my recommendation is to use some industry boards. So for example, this one. It's a real, real, real-time computer. It's an uh, ARM Cortex on it, a lot of memory, a lot of power, and the m definitely don't use, you know, any interpreter on it. So, for example, if you need to do real-time calculation, don't use anything on the top of the basic line of the, you know, of the of this processor. So the good idea is really make an uh, application which runs directly on the core, with any layers between. So then, this is a real time computer. If you write the application properly, on the very low, low level, using assembler or something like that, you have a lot of power and it's really real time. Uh, now I have on this chip is installed .NET Micro Framework. It will not work because .NET Micro Framework is, let's say, the, your application is, let's say, interpreted. So it's really not real time. You have no direct access to memory and so on. But what you can do, even if you have you are running the .NET Micro Framework, so one layer, you can go below this layer, layer and you can write real-time application running on the same chip with .NET Micro Framework. So, for example, you can use .NET Micro Framework uh, to control display and another app below, closer to the core, to make your uh, you know, calculation intensive uh, com calculations. And the second answer is, I am working with this stuff because it's enough for me, so I don't use any TI processors, stuff like that. It's just my choice. Um, and uh, just, just one. Um, the, the link, uh, the data rate between the device and the computer? Uh, uh, the data rate between device and computer, it really depends uh, which kind of connectivity do you use. So you are limited, for example, on serial port, you are limited of the, you have the limitation of the serial port. But it really depends uh, uh, what you know, what, uh, which uh, peripheries you can connect to the computer. So for example, definitely you can use USB. This one has, uh, which one, this one? So it's a USB host, so you can use USB, so you, you know the sampling or you, need, you know the speed of the connectivity of the USB. Or you can use some, it really depends on the hardware here. So for example, if you take a big box, you can add some uh, boards inside, for example, for I2C communication, which, is, which has very big sampling rate. So it really depends what you have, it really depends on the hardware. So you can use a uh, lot of kinds of communication between. Okay. So here was the question. Okay. Hi. Uh, I have a question about Zigbee. Uh, how to configure, how to configure uh, routing, and dressing, uh, and is there something like TCIP? Yeah. 
So, uh, it's not if you have the automa if you want if you want to use the automatic routing, it's not recommended to ha to use the more than ten nodes. If you want to control routing yourself, you need to switch from the serial port communication to API. So wait a moment, I need to open another presentation here. So, first, uh, every Zigbee uh, module has some address. Uh, uh, serial high, it's a vendor number, and serial low, it's the unique address for that module. So, if you want to communicate between two modules, you can tell, okay, send this information to the module with that address. But it works good only if you have less than 10 nodes. When, you're, uh, when the Zigbee module is connected to the network, the coordinator, this one, gives the network address to the node. So you need to get information from the node about the network address and send information not to the serial address, but to the uh, network address. It's much quicker, but then before you can do that, you need to switch to API mode. So you are sending information in special format and then you can use instead of, for example, instead of some uh, module serial address, you can use module network address, and it's much quicker. And the routing works like by design. It's, uh, it's very similar to internet. And of course, uh, then you can use the different uh, networks, IDs, and so on. It's very, the Zigbee is quite powerful and special if you understand the API mode. Because the simple configuration like that works only with the network with the less than 10 nodes. If you, want, if you have a huge network, you must use the API mode for the Zigbee. Okay? So you had a question? Did you have? Hi. Um, basically, um, I would like to ask how much it is now about hackering and or whether it's puzzle like you buy a sensor and put it on the right connection and it works. And the second one, um, if you can uh, um, say how much time it uh, takes me to do something working. Like uh, you can choose example from your... Yep. Your past history and uh, so the first question was about the gardening and so on. Yeah, whether it uh, you need uh, whether you need hackering like uh, do the um, Chesky. Soldering. 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 Okay. Sorry. Record the question. The question is uh, okay. I may I probably I make it more similar. Okay, how difficult is to start with that? Okay, it depends. So I uh, disconnect this, this. The from my opinion is the easiest way, but the most expensive one is to use Those kinds of the modules. Uh, the this is uh, .NET Gadgeteer. .NET Gadgeteer is a product of the Microsoft Research here in Cambridge, and it's some kinds of Stavebnice uh, in Czech. Uh, in German, it's uh, Baukasten kit in English. 
So it's some kind of the kit. So you really take some... So I have a display. I have a, a barometer and a, a thermometer. Then I open uh, Visual Studio. Sorry. I just drag and drop the sensors I want to use. Then I right click, connect all modules. So I look on the schema, just put it together. And the uh, code is. If you know, dot, especially if you are a .NET developer, it's a just .NET, nothing more. So here you can see I have uh, barometer. When the barometer gives me data, it creates some event. And here I have uh, some event handler. Just clear display, print string on the display. And here I am sending the data uh, to a uh, wireless module. So it's very easy for rapid prototyping, very easy. OK, I have absolutely no idea about electronics. So I know what is resistor. I know what is transistor. I know what is let emitted diode. And that's all. So I'm not expert in electronics. But using this some, k some kind of the kit, I can very quick make some proto for prototyping, making some small devices, it works perfect. Uh, and special, the Visual Studio is a very simple, very good environment to write the applications. Or you can use Or the, this is the one way. The second way is the Arduino style. And if you start using the Arduino, you need to find the proper shield for your solution. Oh, I lost my own. Ah, too many devices on table. <laughs> so we have something like that here. Or... Okay. So you need to find a proper shield. Or you can create your own shield. And then you need to electronic. So for example, I... Mm, it I think it was a mistake because I have a shield to controlling the DSL cam DSLR camera. So you can use it as a camera trap. I built it for my kids because we have a cat at home and kids were wondering what the cat is doing when we are not at home. So I create a camera trap, so the, uh, the motion sensor controlling through the shield for uh, Fast Panda, this is this one, my, uh, my camera. So, okay, we didn't any pictures of our cat because the cat were all day sleeping, of course. So it's, it's cat. So, but this shield, I just create some idea of that shield and I asked a friend of mine who is the very experienced guy in electronics and he created the shield for me and I paid for it. So it really depends. Uh, now I am in situation that I started with uh, those kinds of the those kind of the kits. Now I am moving lower and lower and lower. I am teaching. I am learning new stuff, and now I am working more with this Arduino-like boards. Even if I don't really know electronic too much, but I learned some stuff, so I can use it now. But definitely. At the beginning, you don't need to how to solder. You don't need to know anything about electronics. Just put connectors together. And I think we have time for last question. No time? No. So, okay.
thanks for coming and I spent last night to clean it here. So have a nice campus party. Thank you very much, Mr. Stepan. Okay, before all of you all of you go, I have an announcement to make. Uh, some of you during the presentations have been receiving little single ferry tickets and some SIM cards. This is basically because we're tr uh, the angel, the auto angels are trying to give away some stuff, and we want to give it away to you, the people that pay most attention. So they are watching you. Be careful, and uh, they will be like they will be basically giving out the stuff to you and. If you come in for the talk, you pay attention, you ask questions, you will definitely get one of them. So, thank you for listening. See you tomorrow on the Women in Tech Day. Definitely some good stuff coming up. Good night, guys. <laughs>